my answer will be y equals 2x divided by x squared plus an arbitrary constant. But I'll, to indicate it's different from that one, I'll call it c1. c1 is 2 times the old one, but that doesn't really matter. So there's the solution. It has an arbitrary constant in it, but you notice not an additive arbitrary constant. The arbitrary constant is tucked into the solution. If you have to sell, satisfy an initial condition, you would take this form and you, starting from this form, tell, figure out what C1 was in order to satisfy that initial condition. Thus, Bernoulli equation is solved. Our first Bernoulli equation, isn't that exciting? Uh, so let me. Here was the equation, and there is its solution. Now, the one I'm asking you to solve on the problem set in part two isn't a lot, is no harder than this, uh, except I ask you some hard questions about it. Uh, not very hard, but a little hard uh, about it. But inter I, I hope you'll find them interesting questions. Uh, you already have the experimental evidence from the first problem set, and the problem is to explain the experimental evidence by actually solving the equation and seeing. I, I think you'll find it interesting, but maybe that's just a pious hope. Uh, OK. I'd like now to turn to the second method, uh, where a second class of equations which require inverse substitution. And those are equations which are called homogeneous, a highly overworked word in differential equations and in mathematics in general. But it's unfortunately just the right word to describe them. So these are homogeneous first order ODEs. Now, I already used the word in one context in talking about the linear equation when 0 was the right hand side. Uh, this is different, but nonetheless, the two uses of the word have the same common source. A homogeneous differential equation, uh, homogeneous new speak, is y prime equals, it's a question of what the right-hand side looks like. And now the simplest way to say it is, you should be able to write the right-hand side as a function of a combined variable y divided by x. In other words, after fooling around with it, the right-hand side a little bit, you should be able to write it so that every time a variable appears, it's always in the combination y over x. Uh, let me give some examples. Uh, for example, suppose, uh, suppose uh, y prime were, uh, let's say, x squared y divided by x cubed plus y cubed. Well, that doesn't look in that form. Well, yes, it is. Imagine dividing the top and bottom by x cubed. What would you get? The top would be y over x if you divided it by x cubed. And if I divide the bottom by x cubed also, which, of course, doesn't change the value of the fraction, as they say in elementary school, 1 plus y over x cubed. So this is the way it started out looking, but you who said, aha, that was a homogeneous equation because I could see it could be written that way. How about uh, another homogeneous equation? Uh, hmm. How about uh, xy prime? Is that a homogeneous equation? Of course it is. Otherwise, why would I be talking about it? Uh, if you divide through by x, you can tuck it inside the radical, the square root, if you remember to square it when you do that. And it becomes the square root of x squared over x squared, which is 1, plus, this, plus y squared over x squared. It's homogeneous. Now, you might say, hey, this looks like you have to be rather clever to uh, figure out if an equation is homogeneous. Is there some other way? Yeah, there is another way. And it's the other way which explains why it's called homogeneous. You can think of it this way. It's, it's an equation which is, in modern speak, invariant, invariant 
under, under the operation zoom. What is zoom? Zoom is you increase the scale equally on both axes. So the zoom operation is the one which sends x into a times x and y into a times y. In other words, you change the scale on the ax, both axes by the fa same factor a. Now what I say is, uh, gee, maybe I shouldn't write it like this. Why don't we say we introduce, uh, how about this? So we ch um, think of it as a change of variables, like we'll write it like that. So the, you can put here an equal sign if you don't know what this meaningless arrow means. So I'm making this change of variables, and I'm describing it in the inverse as an inverse substitution. But of course, it wouldn't make any difference if I, it's exactly the same as the direct substitution I started out with. Under scaling, the only difference is I'm not using different scales on both axes. I'm expanding them both equally. That's what I mean by zoom. Now, what happens to the equation? Well, what happens to dy over dx? Well, dx is a dx1, dy is a dy1, and therefore the ratio dy by dx is the same as dy1 over dx1. So the left-hand side becomes dy1 over dx1, and the right-hand side becomes f of, well, y over x is the same as y over y, since I've scaled them equally, this is the same as y1 over x1. So it's y1 over x1, and the net effect is I simply, everywhere I have an x, I change it to x1, and wherever I have a y, I change it to y1, which, what's in a name, it's the identical equation. So I haven't changed the equation at all by a zoom transformation, and that's what makes it homogeneous. Uh, that's not an uncommon use of the word homogeneous. It's, you know, when you say space is homogeneous in every direction, well, that means, I don't know, means it's this, you know, the same, okay, that's, I, I'm getting in trouble there. Uh, uh, let's, I'll let it go with this since I can't prepare any, any better, I haven't prepared any better explanation, but this is a pretty good one. Okay, so suppose we've got a homogeneous equation. How do we solve it? <clears throat> so here's our equation, uh, f of y over x. Well, what substitution would you like to make? Obviously, we should make a direct substitution, z equals y over x. So why did he say that this was going to be an example of inverse substitution? Uh, because I wanted to confuse you. But look, that's fine. You will know, if you write it in that form, you will know exactly what to do with the right-hand side. And this is why everybody loves to do that. Unfortunately, you have to substitute into the left-hand side as well. And I can testify from many years of looking with sinking hard at examination papers, what happens if you try to make a direct substitution like this? You say, oh, I need z prime. z prime equals, well, I better use the quotient rule for differentiating that. And you know, it comes out this long. And then either a long pause, what do I do now? Because it's not at all obvious what to do at that point. Or much worse, two pages of frantic calculations and giving up in total despair. Now, the reason for that is because you made a try to do it making a direct substitution. All you have to do instead is use it, treat it as an inverse substitution, write y equals zx. What's the motivation for doing that? It's clear from the equation. When you have to, and it, this goes through all of mathematics, whenever you have to change a variable, excuse me, whenever you have to change, Whenever you have to change a variable, look at what you have to substitute for and focus your attention on that. I need to know what y prime is. OK, well, then I better know what y is. 
If I know what y is, do I know what y prime is? Oh, of course. y prime is z prime x plus z times the derivative of this factor, which is 1. And now I've turned with that one stroke, the equation has now become z prime x plus z is equal to f of z. Well, I don't know. Can I solve that? Sure. Sure, that can be solved because this is x times dz dx. Just put the z on the other side. It's f of z minus z. And now this side is just a function of z. Separate variables. And the only thing to watch out for is at the end, the z was your business. You've got to put the answer back in terms of x and y. OK, let's uh, work an example of this. Uh, I, since I haven't done any modeling yet this period, let's do a, make a little model, differential equations model. In other words, a physical situation, which will be solved by an equation. And guess what? The equation will turn out to be homogeneous. OK. So the situation is as follows. We're in the Caribbean somewhere, the little isolated island with a lighthouse on it at the origin. And a beam of light shines from the lighthouse. The beam of light can rotate the way lighthouse beams. But this particular beam is being controlled by a guy in the lighthouse who can aim it wherever he wants. And the reason he's interested in aiming it wherever he wants is that there's a drug boat here, <laughs> which is has just been caught in the beam of light, so drug boat. <laughs> Which has just been caught in the beam of light and feels it's better escape. Now, the, the lighthouse keeper wants to keep the drug boat, the light shining on so that the uh, US Coast Guard helicopters can zoom over it and I do whatever they do to drug boats, I don't know. Uh, so uh, the drug boat immediately has to up follow an escape strategy, and the only one that occurs to him is to, well, he wants to go further away, of course, from the lighthouse. On the other hand, it doesn't seem sensible to do it in a straight line because the beam will keep shining on him. So he uh, fixes the boat at some angle, let's say, and goes off so that the angle stays 45 degrees. So goes so that the angle between the beam and the uh, maybe the, draw the beam a little uh, less like a 45 degree angle. <clears throat> so the angle between the beam and the boat, the boat's path is always 45 degrees. Goes at a constant 45 degree angle to the beam, hoping thereby to escape it. On the other hand, of course, the lighthouse guy keeps the beam always on the boat. Uh, so it's not clear it's a good strategy, but this is a differential equations class. Uh, the question is, what's the path of the boat? What's the boat? What's the boat's the boat's path? Now, an obvious question is, why is this a problem in differential equations at all? In other words, looking at this, uh, you might scratch your head and try to think of different ways to solve it. But why? what suggests that it's going to be a problem in differential equations? The answer is, you're looking for a path. I'm looking, the answer is going to be a curve. A curve means a function. We're looking for an unknown function, in other words. And what type of information do we have about the function? The only information we have about the function is something about its slope, that its slope it makes a constant 45 degree angle with the lighthouse beam. Its slope makes a constant angle, makes a known angle to a known angle. Well, if, what you, if you're trying to find a function, and all you know is something about its slope, that is a problem in differential equations. Well, let's try to solve it.
Uh, let's see. Well, let me draw just a little bit. So here's the horizontal. Let's introduce a coordinate system. In other words, there's a horizontal. And here's the boat to indicate uh, where I am with respect to the picture. So here's the boat. Here is the beam. And the path of the boat is going to make a 45 degree angle with it. So this is the path that we're talking about. And now let's label what I know. Well, uh, this angle is uh, 45 degrees. This angle I don't know, but of course I can calculate it easily enough because it, it has to do with uh, if I know the coordinates of this point x, y, then of course that horizontal angle, I know the slope of this line and the, the, uh, that angle will be, will be related to the slope. So let's call this alpha. And now what I want to know is what the slope of the whole path is. So y prime, so let's call y equals y of x, the unknown function whose path, whose graph is going to be the uh, boat's path, unknown graph. What's its slope? Well, its slope is the tangent of the sum of these two angles, alpha plus 45 degrees. Now, what do I know? Well, I know that the tangent of alpha is how much? That's y over x. In other words, if this is the point x over y, this is the angle it makes with the horizontal. If you think of it over here, this is parallel. So this angle is the same as that one. And it's y over, its slope is of that line is y over x. So the tangent of the angle is y over x. How about the tangent of 45 degrees? That's 1. And uh, there's a formula. Uh, this is the hard part. All you have to know is the formula exists, and then you look it up if you've forgotten it. Uh, relating the tangent, giving you the tangent of the sum of two angles. And the, you can, if you like, uh, clever, derive it from the formula for the sine of and cosine of the sum of two angles. But one peak is worth a thousand finesses. So it is the tangent of alpha plus the tangent of 45 degrees. Let me write it out in all its gory details divided by 1, so you'll at least learn the formula, 1 minus tangent alpha times tangent 45 degrees. This would work for the tangent to the sum of any two angles. That's the formula. So how does that, what do I get then? Y prime is equal to the tangent of alpha, which is y over x. Oh, I like that combination. Plus 1 divided by 1 minus y over x times 1. Now, there's no reason for doing anything to it, but let's make it look a little prettier and thereby make it less obvious that it's a homogeneous equation. Uh, it's, if I multiply top and bottom by x, it looks prettier. x plus y over x minus y equals y prime. That's our differential equation. But notice that last step to make it look pretty has undone the good work it's fine if you immediately recognize this as being a homogeneous equation because you can divide top and bottom by x. But here it's a lot clearer that it's a homogeneous equation because it's already been written in the right form. OK, let's solve it now since we know what to do. Uh, we're going to use as the new variable z equals y over x. And as I wrote up there, z uh, for y prime will substitute z prime x plus z. And with that, let's solve. Let's solve it. The equation becomes z prime x plus z is equal to z plus 1 over 1 minus z. Put the z on the other. We want to separate variables, so you have to put all the z's on one side. So this is going to be x dz dx equals this thing minus z, 
which is z plus 1 over 1 minus z minus z. And now, as you realize, putting it on the other side, I'm going to have to turn it upside down. Just as before, if you have to turn something upside down, it's better to combine the terms and make it one tiny little fraction. Otherwise, you're in for a, uh, quite a lot of mess if you don't do this nicely. So z plus 1 minus z, that gets rid of the z's. The numerator is 1 minus z squared over 1 minus z, I hope. 1, is that right? 1 plus z squared over 1 minus z. And so the equation is dz, and what is the, put this on the other side and turn it upside down, so that will be 1 minus z over 1 plus z squared on the left hand side and on the right hand side dx over x. Well that's ready to be integrated just as it stands. Uh, the right hand side integrates to be log x. The left hand side is the sum of two terms. The integral of 1 over 1 plus z squared is yeah, the arctangent of z maybe. The derivative of this is 1 over 1 plus z squared. How about the term z over 1 plus z squared? Well, that integrates to be a logarithm. It's more or less the logarithm of 1 plus z squared. Uh, how does much do I, if I differentiate this, I get 1 over 1 plus z squared times 2z, but I wish I had negative z there instead. Therefore, I should put a minus sign and I should mu multiply that by half to make it come out right. And this is log x on the right hand side plus put in that arbitrary constant. And now what? Well, let's now fool around with it a little bit. Uh, the arc tangent, I'm going to simultaneously, uh, no, two steps. <laughs> I have to remember your innocence, okay. Uh, although probably a lot of you are better calculators than I am. Uh, I'm going to change this, use as many laws of logarithms as possible. I'm going to put this in the exponent and put this on the other side. That's going to turn it into the log of 1 plus z squared, the square root of 1 plus z squared. And this is going to be plus the log of x plus c. And now I'm going to make, go back and remember that z equals y over x. So this becomes the arctangent of y over x equals, now, I combine the logarithms. This is the log of x times this square root, right? Make one logarithm out of it. And then put z equals y over x. And you see that if you do that, it'll be the log of x times the square root of 1 plus y over x squared. And what is that? Well, if I put this over x squared and take it out, it cancels that. And what you're left with is the log of the square root of x squared plus y squared plus a constant. Now, technically you've solved the equation, but not morally. <laughs> because, I mean, my God, what a mess, you know, incredible path. Who could, you know, tells me absolutely nothing. Wow, what is this screaming? Change me to polar coordinates. What's the arctangent of y over x? Theta in polar coordinates. It's theta. What's, this is r. So the curve is theta equals the log of r plus a constant. And I can make even that look a little better if I exponentiate everything. Exponentiate both sides, combine this in the usual way. And what you get is that r is equal to some other constant times e to the theta. That's the curve. It's called an exponential spiral. And that's what the that's what our little boat goes in. And notice, probably if I'd set up the problem in polar coordinates from the beginning, nobody would have been able to solve it, but anyone who did would have gotten that answer immediately. Thanks.